And with the housing market and construction declines brought about by the economic recession of 2008-2009, Arkansas's timber industry has certainly felt the hit. Layoffs, closures, slowdowns, and lower production have hammered companies directly and indirectly. So it's pretty phenomenal that one Arkansas-based timber firm has not only survived, but thrived. As part of our continuing CEO series, Delta Trust and Bank CEO French Hill has a one-on-one with Delta Timber CEO Ray Dillon, who explains the secrets to his success and what to watch for going forward. Well, the timber industry the last three years has been one of the most challenging places to be in the U.S. economy, and yet Delta Timber seems uh, that you've had three years of profitability, three years of positive cash flow, you've paid down debt, uh, you've really been had a great track record looking back uh, at the tough economy that we've come through. Well, French, I would tell you that's not a mistake. Uh, we've got great assets. We've got, for a small company, by many standards, we've got a very diverse group of assets, and quite frankly, they're intensively managed and well managed. And we've been blessed and fortunate enough to be able to perform in literally the worst building products and real estate markets since the Great Depression. So we feel very fortunate. Uh, there's a lot of hard work goes into having these assets earn the return that they're capable of in this environment. Well, from what I read, it looks like we're going to have to be uh, cautious about performance in the timber product and forest products industry for several years to come. I was looking at uh, Morningstar uh, just last week, and they were analyzing the six million jobs lost during the recession period and they felt like a quarter were absolutely were direct, directly related to housing construction and then a third to half based on all the ancillary things that go into construction furniture timber uh, carpeting the retailers and when you think about that that really i think is an excellent explanation for people about What's the state of our economy? I mean, when you boil it down and say, look, half the layoffs are directly or indirectly related to housing, in one sense, it gives people comfort. They have an explanation. I think people are looking for an explanation. But on the other side, that means that we're not out of the woods yet, no pun intended, when we still have foreclosures pending and, and we're in no construction on the horizon. Well, French, you're right. You can boil it down to, to some very basic terms. Unemployment, credit, uh, consumer confidence, mm -hmm. and and all of those things add up to jobs and paychecks. And without jobs, without paychecks, normal people are going to be making big purchases, mainly housing in today's world that we live in. So, um, uh, from a building product, some, for someone that's in the building products industry, such as Deltic Timber, with a core land base, growing growing timber. To convert that into lumber, that, that literally 100% of it uh, goes into housing or some form of construction materials, but right. primarily housing. So to get America going, we've got to get housing going. And that's going to, and if we get housing going, we'll start seeing unemployment numbers turn around also. Well, do you, do you see that time is the best healer there, or do you think there's some action that could be taken by uh, bankers or government policy or the courts? <laughs> that would lead to a, a, a more quick clearing of the overhang in the, in the industry. What, I mean, what are you reading and thinking about? There may could be, French, but I don't know what it is. What you have to be careful is, is that we don't recreate the problem yeah. that, we, that we just got out of. Fundamentally, we had too many houses that were going to too many uh, individuals that really didn't have the balance sheet nor the income to support. Right. And then that's what's got us into the overhang of vacant homes that are sitting out here that are foreclosed or new homes that have never been lived in. So it is going to take some time, and we're going to have to, to let this wash through the system. And, and we're closer to the end uh, than we were, but it's still got some time to go. It could be two to three years having the housing industry right. begin to, let's call it, normalize. Now, my fear is that there's a new normal associated with housing. Whether housing's the American dream anymore for, for the young generation that's struggling to find a job today after they've went to school, prepared for the American dream, uh, what's their mindset going to be 
about an asset that literally takes a large majority of their working career to pay for, mm -hmm. and and whether it's escalating in value, like would have been an assumption before this recession that we've been through, mm -hmm. and rather than declining in value, and you know my prediction is is that we'll see we'll see different homes rather than McMansions, we'll begin to see smaller homes, maybe more functional, um, and. We'll, we'll wait and see what the younger generation is looking for as far as housing. And then, really, it comes down to how much of their income do they want to allocate to rent, be it in the form of a mortgage or, or rental property. Right, right. You know, Multifamily properties you know, are very, very uh, active today. Uh, we've got uh, you know, several people looking at multifamily projects. We've got, got one or two that's being built in West Little Rock today. Mm -hmm. So. So, um, you know, I'm not sure there's not a mindset yeah. associated with do I own a home or do I rent a condo or a very nice apartment. So, And that'll probably speak to the issue of suburban versus urban sure. infill, too, Absolutely. Uh, as, as those new generations decide what fits their lifestyle. Uh, Chanel reacted, though, and in in you all have done a great job in selling some product with a smaller lot size, and those have done very well for you during these even down times, have they not? Yeah, you have to constantly you know, change your product to what the market is, right. and, and we have um, uh, went to a smaller lot product, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's been uh, received very well, and we've, we're looking at other projects that are similar, uh, but quite frankly, the uncertainty associated with what's the news going to be tomorrow and how our market's going to react to it and whether we're going to have 5,000 employees laid off at a, at a financial institution mm -hmm. or a manufacturer that's going to shut down just literally because they have no market and can't afford to, to keep putting, putting it in inventory, whatever their product may be. Well, you know, it's, you, you look at the housing um, building permits and they just seem bouncing along at 600,000 units and in a normal year for the last 20 years it would be about a million two household formations a year or so. So we're at now at a 50 percent rate. I guess we're going into our fourth year at that sort of 50 percent rate and we only had them running uh, including condominiums at a million over that. We were building two million, two million five houses but just for two or three years there so it seems like we are closer to the end than, than the beginning because we're not building new homes for a country of our size. And while they're sure there's allegedly four million homes in foreclosure at some process. Um, well, French, you're, you know, you're a student of, the, of, of economics and, yeah. and you know that, that whenever there's an oversupply, there'll be a reaction. And when there's an undersupply, there'll be a reaction. And you're exactly right. What we see today is, is an oversupply of housing, and the market is, is reflecting that. Okay, But it won't be that way forever. Right. And household formation in the United States, the statistics still look very, very good. So, so it, time will cure the problem, and then we'll see home values begin to escalate in, in the future years. And we'll see housing construction return to some normalized level, yeah, whatever that turns, whatever out. That turns mm -hmm. out to be. But uh, you know, I still believe that people want to own a home. They want to have their own uh, backyard for the dog and children to play in, and those type of things. So, but well, but we'll see. Well, looking looking kind of forward now for the forest products industry, and, and away from looking backwards. It's too depressing to look backwards. We got to look <laughs> look forward. Um, a lot of changes internationally are affecting the demand for forest products and the effect on the southern pine timber here in in Arkansas and uh, in the south generally. I mean, I, I'm thinking about uh, the terrible blight across the whole western United States and the pine beetle that's destroying uh, a lot of the mature forest there. And then the demand for, for um, imports uh, in Asia particularly of American raw lumber, which I think blows people away that that's a profitable thing to do to send raw logs uh, all the way across the ocean, and pulp too, obviously. What's, those, those bode well for the future for demand here in the South, don't they, those, those trends? They do, even though unfortunately it's uh, quite frankly a natural disaster what's happened in the mm. uh, 
west, uh, you know, the uh, western provinces in, in Canada, British Columbia, specifically with the mountain pine beetle. I mean, you know, thousands of acres of, of high quality timber has been decimated there. And, you know, traditionally, uh, in rough terms, a third of the lumber to the United States has come from Canada. And with, with what's happened uh, in British Columbia with the mountain pine beetle, and also with, with the harvest in, in the providence of Quebec, uh, will we'll equate to less lumber from Canada coming to the United States in years to come, and it will put more demand on the southern forest, which will, and the southern forest will react to that demand and will meet that demand. Uh, now, as, as you mentioned, exports, uh, you know, first it was Japan, now it's China that traditionally exports logs and lumber off the west coast and literally every log or every board that leaves Seattle or Portland or some other west coast port uh, going, going to the Far East, you know, basically helps add demand to the southern, to the southern wood basket. And so, so the future's bright for the southern wood basket. And, and there'll be a place for building materials. As, as I said, we've just got to let time cure that problem and, and then we'll get this economy going when, and we'll see people go back to work and they'll start spending money. We've seen a lot of huge forest product companies, many times larger than Delta Timber, choose to exit the land ownership business. And as a value investor, you know, I've always found that odd and I've never quite, even though intellectually I know why they've done it, I've never thought, you know, on a 50, 100, or 150 year basis how that produced long-term results. You've done the opposite. You've got 450,000 acres and probably if the price were right would, would acquire more. What's Deltic's uh, philosophy on land ownership and the stewardship thereof? Well, the, the people you're talking about, the primarily their end product, even though it was wood-based or fiber-based, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, their focus was on that end product and mainly the facilities or, or companies you're talking about are or the mainline pulp and paper companies that historically the pulp and paper business has been very challenging where it's rarely earned its cost of capital mm -hmm. and and so through many years of fighting those economic battles uh, the the land and the forest uh, might have been let's call it undermanaged I'll use that term or mismanaged from the standpoint of creating the value uh, that it should have created and, and many pulp and paper companies uh, felt like that they needed to, to put those, that land and timber in other hands. Uh, and so they did so. They liquidated it, turned it into cash, which helped them pay down debt, which helped them solve financial problems that they had. Um, as far as whether that turns out to be the right decision, mm -hmm. time will tell. But, but literally, the pulp and paper companies in North America today don't own any land, and and we'll see if it's the right decision to put it in in the hands of financial owners. As far as Deltic Timber is concerned, you know one of our strategic focuses is to grow our land base, not only locally, okay, but in in the uh, the southern region, and so we're constantly looking for land opportunities, and uh, very interested in them, and and are proud to add high quality lands to our portfolio. Well, another trend that's going on in forest products seems to be the uh, sort of the flavor of the day is is the environmental uh, energy movement, which long run, no one questions that we will be getting more and more of our electricity, industrial and, and homeowner electricity generated by some renewable sources. And we don't have much wind in the hot, humid days of Arkansas. <laughs> Uh, and we don't, uh, we have some solar, but it's not the solar you have in an Arizona. So one thing we have is a lot of pine forest biomass that comes from the normal cutting operations. What's, um, do you see a future in that for Arkansas as part of our gross domestic product 20 years from now? Well, I don't know the time frame. And really, I don't know if it's 10 years or 20 years. Yeah. But it starts with, with really an energy policy. And then as part of that, a renewable energy standard that's going to, to have the country shift from, let's call it coal, natural gas, fuel oil of some type, or nuclear. Not that you would shift out of all of these, but right. the additional demand that's created. Yeah, it's incremental. Whether it comes from green sources or environmentally friendly sources. 
Most people think of wind and solar, but that's not all that there is. And each energy sector in the country couldn't supply 20 or 30 percent right. of its power from those right. sources, which, as you said, the southeastern part of the United States couldn't do that. And wood fiber or biomass is going to be a part of that solution if there's ever a renewable energy standard in the United States and sectors are required to attain that. Uh, so yes, that will add demand to the forest, but really it will put us as, I'll call it, collectors and manufacturers of forest products to taking waste that is today left in the forest and, and that will be harvested, okay, harvested meaning pick it up, grind right. it up, and take it to the energy plant. Uh, you know, converting biomass or wood fiber to steam and electricity is not new technology. It's been done for years, primarily in the pulp and paper industry, because it was a natural. Mm -hmm. So, so the technology is there. It's uh, scale uh, it's, is there. Scale is yeah. there. The efficiencies are there. And um, what about you know, BTU content? Uh, you know, with today's technology, you know, it's very efficient. Okay. And depend, you know, it's very efficient inside of a, of a of a paper mill, uh, but with a single pass, you know, just electric plants, not right. quite as efficient. Right. But, right. but we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But again, until there is an energy policy with a renewable energy standard, uh, it's just going to continue to be a lot of talk. Would you, if you were uh, the next president and setting energy policy, what, how would you phrase what would be an acceptable, youth, from the economic point of view, an acceptable long-range energy policy. In other words, that private industry could do that over time without mass unemployment or huge consumer uh, increases in electrical bills. Obviously, all that has some give and take in it, but I mean, well, given it, that technology, well, how, how would we... How would well, we in my that? opinion, it's got to start with, with whatever the technology is. Mm -hmm. It's got to stand on its own, can't be subsidized, right. and it's got to be affordable. The, the reason that we're still using coal, gas, nuclear, and oil today is because it's the, it's the most cost efficient, even though it puts stresses on other parts of our economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you know, the, the technology that I just described is it is available, it is attainable, it is renewable, um, and quite frankly, I've always wondered why utilities in the southeast didn't already utilize them. Right. Or at least uh, right. some of their load from it as sure. a supplement to right. standard. You know, natural gas certainly will be yeah. will be much better for a peak load mm -hmm. demand mm -hmm. rather than than biomass, but uh, but it, it you know it can still fit in many many uh, energy sectors uh, in the country. Well, part of I guess part of uh, a nice part of your success aside from some commercial uh, real estate sales over the last three years has been the royalty production and, and shale gas production in the Fayetteville shale where you have property that you've leased to producers. And, and recently we read this year that you've uh, leased during at the end of 2010 and 11 lands back in the old uh, oil rich South Arkansas home territory of Deltic Timber for the so called dense brown formation. Brown dense formation. Is that, um, is that an oil play down there that uh, technology is going after, or is it gas or both? Tell us a little bit about what the producers are thinking they've got under that ground. Well, I will. And as I said in the beginning, you know, Deltic is very, very fortunate to have a very diverse group of assets. And certainly, uh, uh, the natural gas and the Fayetteville shale, and, and now the potential oil and gas mm -hmm. from the new lower smackover for, formation, the brown dense play, uh, and with uh, the sus substantial resources of Southwestern Energy, which is, you know, has recently uh, been announced as the primary uh, developer of that play, and using the horizontal drilling technology, you know, we're very uh, excited. We think it's going to be a boom for South Arkansas, um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, it's going to be a boom for the royalty owners um, in that region. And you know, we're we're actively leasing lands today and continue to uh, to do that. Uh, we've got uh, you know, there's two or three wells, test wells being drilled today. There's no public information mm -hmm. uh, yet available for those, but uh, you know, we know the resources there. It's just how efficient is the new technology right. in recovering it and what's the cost.
Right. So, so stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah. More to come. Um, I would tell you that it's a great option to have. <laughs> well, you uh, you still fight uh, being in the forest products in- industry. Uh, I guess uh, a lot of regulation of various aspects of of your industry. Um, I often talk when I'm with audiences about it's so easy to talk about tax policy because it's so transparent. People are either want tax rates higher or lower depending on where they sit and what they're interested in to generate revenue for the country, uh, pay down uh, debt. But, and, and that's easy to talk about. What's a lot harder to talk about is the economic impact of regulatory policy. It's much more pervasive. Everybody deals with it. We certainly deal with it in the banking industry. Talk about the regulatory burden in the forest products industry and uh, how you deal with it, uh, what you think's the future, uh, things you're concerned about there. Well, certainly we all have our share of regulations to deal with. Uh, The EPA has been around a long time, pulp and paper facilities. Um, have dealt with EPA regulations, and I'm proud to say have has met every challenge uh, that's been right. put in front of of them. The industry has an outstanding record of being environmentally responsible and improving our environmental record year over year. As far as the challenges that we face today, you know, with the economy in the, in the I'll call it coming, just hopefully beginning to recover from mm-hmm. from the deepest recession we've had since the Great Depression. Um, to add regulatory challenges on top of that today just uh, feels like a burden that's just too hard to carry. What am I talking about? Boiler Mac, which is something that... What is that? Explain that. Uh, it's uh, new regulatory requirements to deal with clean air emissions and, and more stringent standards. And, and really, what was already in place was extremely stringent, and these are even, or the proposed ones, are more stringent. And what that would require... Could, could be billions of dollars of capital to be ad- invested in the pulp and paper and I'll call it forest products industries, sawmills, uh, OSB plants. Hmm. Uh, What's uh, OSB mean? Uh, oriented orient strand board. Okay. It's, it's a sheeting mm-hmm. uh, 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 panel product that, that's quite frankly replaced plywood in, in most applications. So, so Boiler Mac is one that, that we're worried about on, on the uh, mill side of our business. And then in the forest side of the business is, is really regulating forest roads as point sources uh, requiring permits for activity. That activity could be replacing a culvert. That activity could be a um, drainage ditch to take water away from the road to protect it. Etc. So, so these are all active discussions that are going on in our nation's capital, and the industry is responding to those. Mm-hmm. So, of course, all of us want clean air and clean water, and so really, it's a matter of degree, like in the road issue, about what's reasonable well, on 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 repair of an existing road and using high quality soil conservation techniques to protect runoff from a nearby stream, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, so it's a it's, question of balance in your view? It's a question of balance, but really it's a question of the regulatory environment and permitting process. Yeah, so would it's, I have to do get a permit to do something that I'm already responsible that, for? Responsible now? for and okay. already graded on. Right. It's it's just the administrative requirement mm-hmm. for a permit. And and so you know, that's, that's not in place today. Uh, there's not a need for it to be in place. However, um, you know, there's, there's another side of, of that discussion, and that, that discussion's been taking place in Washington mm-hmm. today. Well, good. Well, tell me, um, uh, first I want to thank you for participating in our visit today. <laughs> I've been very informative. I always learn something when I'm with you. Tell me what led you to uh, get into the industry, the timber industry. Well, I grew up in South Mississippi. Uh, pulp wood, saw timber, paper milling was a way of life. Undergraduate degrees in chemical engineering. And um, unlike many of my classmates, I went to work in the uh, pulp and paper industry. Uh, pulp and paper uh, initially as a process engineer, but eventually uh, responsible for all procurement in Gaylord Container Corporation. Mm-hmm. And when you're a pulp and paper company and you don't own a sing- single acre of timberland, the first thing you do is you learn who owns the trees <laughs> and you go work with them 
and, and you find out how that, that you can partner with them to become one of your valued suppliers. And so, so that led me into the forest and, and a working knowledge of the forest. Um, then you might recall, um, you know, I, I operated or managed a paper mill in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and owned by Gaylord Container at the time. Didn't, did not own any uh, uh, forest land here in the state, so go, got, to, got to know the owners of the forest land and the byproducts that come from sawmills, et cetera. And so then when I returned as CEO of Deltic Timber, it was, a, it was really a natural. It was a homecoming. It was a homecoming and, and still um, associated with many friends that I made years ago um, where we buy timber from them. We sell chips to many people. Uh, that I used to work with uh, from years past. Um, so it's it's a natural for Ray Dillon to be in the forest. It's a natural for him to be in wood products. Understands the end markets as far as pulp and paper. Uh, we're very, very fortunate here in this state to have outstanding forest, outstanding wood product facilities, and outstanding pulp and paper facilities. And it's an integral part. They all have to work together for each each leg to be successful. 